safe and well, and looking forward to this morning's service. I'm looking forward to getting together with you all again uh, once all this hoo ha has gone over. But in the meantime, God bless. Cheers. And hello, family at Tremont. We're missing you and look forward to seeing you. Take care. Yes, it's good to be able to do this through the technology and it's uh, it'll be good to be able to contact the family at Clement and I hope you're all doing well and enjoying this lovely weather we're having this weather uh, during this time. Hi, this is uh, Gordon Palmer here, Minister at Clement Church and this is our service for Sunday 28th of June. As well as myself um, in the service, the prayers for others are going to be led in that by the young folks in our, our Renew group. Let us hear from the psalmist as we begin our service. He says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To Him who alone does great wonders, His love endures forever who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever, who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Let us join together in prayer, and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer, the form of the Lord's Prayer that we use. Words for that will come on the screen. Let us pray. Gracious God, your love endures forever. We come to you as a good God, as the Lord of lords, the source of all life, you who are before all things, you who are beyond all things, and yet who looks after the world day by day. It is through your Spirit at work in people that we make new discoveries, even things that surprise us but are familiar to you. Your creative word enables our finding you, our hearing you, our being addressed by you, but also our speech, our discourse with one another. We worship you, our God, as the renewer of life. You make the empty places burst into song, the desert blossom as the rose. Come to hearts that are dull and weary and give hope. And you've kept your promise to bring salvation through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Redeemer. And we worship you in his name. The name into which we were brought for your salvation. Jesus, we love you. We honor you and we seek you afresh today. We come just as we are, weary and stained from life's journey. We come with our frail human nature, our sinful human nature, which you shared and dealt with on the cross. We come to grasp your mercy and, and acceptance of us. Come confident because Christ lived and died and rose again for us. And now we love because you first loved us. May our worship bring you delight as your Spirit leads. May our worship bring us renewal as your Son and works among us. May our worship be for the good of your people, but the good of your work and mission in the world. In Jesus' name. And in his words, we give you our prayers. Our Father.
our scripture reading this morning from the book of Galatians in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to be reading verses 16 to 26. Hope you've got a scripture with you that you can follow our reading. If not, you could always press the pause button, go get one, and come back, and I'll still be here, and it will still be Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 26. The apostle writing to the church says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh denies what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Amen. So, we come to our final um, fruit of the Spirit, uh, self-control. And if we think about times when we talk about people losing control, um, we might get a sense of just how important self-control is. We talk about people losing control, maybe a pilot of an aircraft or of a helicopter, a frenzied attack, uh, a protest gets out of control and becomes a riot the forest fire getting out of control. Out of control can be lethally dangerous. And so while self-control might not sound at first as fulfilling a, a thing as joy or peace or whatever, it matters. It matters very much. And this passage in Galatians 5, um, in which Paul gives us the fruit of the Spirit at verses 22 and 23, the context of the passage gives a a good idea as to why self-control matters so much. There's a conflict going on. The flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. Now, the use of flesh here is not simply our physical bodies as opposed to spirit being the immaterial, Rather, flesh is used in the sense of everything that is self-seeking, that is ungodly, as opposed to the spiritual, which is focused on God and following God, spirit-led, Holy Spirit-led. And these two things are in conflict, the flesh and the, the spirit. And rather than simply be at the mercy of whatever urges might grip us, we are to, verse 16, live by the spirit, or verse 18, be led by the spirit and so not gratify, verse 16, the desires of the flesh. There's conflict. And in verses 19 to 21, Paul lists some of the desires and actions that are contrary to life in the Spirit, contrary to the way of Jesus. They relate, yes, to sexual behavior, but also to religion, to relationships, to substance abuse. And those who live according to these desires and actions he says in verse 21, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he doesn't mean that anybody who slips up at all in any of these areas is banished from God's kingdom, because that would exclude all of us. None of us are 100% perfect. No, he's not talking of lapses. He's talking about those who live a way of life that is set on at least some of these things. God is a God of mercy and who forgives. And those who repent and confess and who repent on a regular basis will find forgiveness and find their place in the kingdom of God. And finding our place in the kingdom of God means we are to live as people of that kingdom, citizens of that kingdom. 
Some of the sins that Paul has mentioned in these verses characterize the irreligious, but some are features of religious lifestyle. Religious people are prone to selfishness, envy, factions, and so on. And so, all of us need self-control. All of us need to grow a resistance to sinning, and all of us need to grow a discipline to follow the way of Jesus. Now, we each have a part to play in resisting temptation and in overcoming desires and the pull of our sinful nature, but it's not simply down to our energy and effort. Christians have the Holy Spirit. Every Christian has the Spirit, or they're not a Christian at all. And the Spirit works in our lives to grow the fruit of the Spirit, verses 22 and 23. It is the work of the Spirit to grow that life of Christ in us. And in the past eight weeks, we have looked at the fruit one by one. And the final one, the ninth one on the list, self-control, is about how we are to be in control of our appetites, our desires, our reactions, our ambitions, and so on, so that we, with the Spirit's help, can become more Christ-like. Self-control involves the recognition that sin is not just some occasional lapse, but a force, a power that can be in our lives that we are to resist. And if life is not focused on following Jesus, and if the fruit of the Spirit is not grown, then we become worse. Just as a garden that's not looked after or tended becomes weed-infested or overgrown, it doesn't simply just remain the same. So a life that is not focused on the way of Jesus, so a life that is not Spirit-led, doesn't stay as it was before, doesn't stay neutral, it gets worse. And so there are two ways, and we're choosing the right way and to go the way of Christ involves are bringing into play this final fruit of the Spirit, self-control. Let me illustrate that with reference to two Old Testament stories. In the first, Joseph has been taken into slavery and made a slave in Potiphar's house. He has worked his way up and given a lot more responsibility in the house. But Potiphar's wife has taken a fancy to Joseph, and in Genesis 39, she tries to seduce him. Joseph clears off. He gets out of there. Now, in the event, lies were told about him, and he was punished for something that he hadn't done. But the Lord remained with him, and things turned well. He was in the right place much later on to help out his family in a time of famine. By contrast to that, in 2 Samuel 11, we read the story of David and Bathsheba. David has gone out on the roof at home. His armies are away fighting, and his, as the king, he ought to have been with them, but he'd stayed back, and now on a sunny day, he was out on the roof, and there he saw in the distance Bathsheba having a bath. David should have had self-control. David should have gone back inside the house. But no, he stayed in the roof. He watched. His look lingered. Who is this woman? He finds out. He invites her over. He has sex with her. He gets her pregnant and then tries to cover it up by bringing her husband home. And when that doesn't work, he has her husband killed in battle. And years later, the child that Bathsheba bore becomes a real torment to David, and ruins family relationships and generations ahead. David didn't have self-control, or at least not at that instance, and great damage followed. Lack of self-control has led to sexual anarchy and caused colossal suffering in the years since David's time. All over the world, women and girls have suffered at the hands of rapists, pimps, sex traffickers, abusers, adulterers, pornographers. And often, it's not that a man has set out to be one or more of these, but the lack of self-control has taken him further and further 
into trouble where he oppresses and lashes out and brings harm and danger to others. The not controlling, the not mastering our desires very often leads to sad and oppressive outcomes. Self-control is vital in other areas of our lives too. Our appetites for, for food and for drink, amongst other things. The longing, the hankering that some have after the bigger thrill, the heightened experience. Our tongues, as James says in his chapter 3 of his book, so seemingly little and simple, but what great damage they do if we do not control them. Attitudes, do we let jealousy grow? Revenge thoughts take control. You see, self-control is needed to master all of these. And self-control and the other eight fruit that Paul mentions in verses 22 and 23, and which we've looked at in these past couple of months, they're about how we resist these destructive ways, and how rather we grow as followers of Jesus. And the promise here is that the Holy Spirit helps us. The Holy Spirit's at work. But how does the fruit of the Spirit take root in our hearts and be produced in our lives? Well, verses 24 to 26 of the reading are about that. Three things there. One, we need to remember that we belong to Christ. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, verse 24. In the previous verse, when Paul has said, against such things, the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law, he doesn't mean there's a law banning these things. Nobody's going to pass a law outlawing peace or love or something like that. Rather, he means that there is no way that any law can make these things happen. You can't pass a law or just simply give a rule or an instruction and someone becomes more loving, more joyful, more patient, more kind, and so on. These are transformations that begin within. They come from the new life we have in Christ, given us through the Holy Spirit. And Paul is saying that that kind of Christ-like living doesn't come firstly from obeying laws, but by from submitting to Jesus by faith and by nurturing the life of Christ in us. The kinds of attitudes and behaviors that Paul lists in verses 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit, they come through our being a new person, a new creation in Christ. So, one, remember whose we are. We belong to Jesus. We, we are not our own if we are in Christ and if we are Christians. And secondly, verse 24, he says, because we belong to Christ, we have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's about strangling sin at the motivational level. So David should have done that, shouldn't he, on the rooftop? He saw Bathsheba, he, he became attracted, he should have strangled it at that point and gone back indoors. Crucifying the flesh is that kind of thing. It's taking these desires by the scruff of the neck and throwing them out of our life. They're part of the true and regular repentance that should be a daily experience for Christians. And the way we live the Christian life is a way that involves decisive action to squash sin. We have crucified the flesh, says Paul. That's pretty definite, isn't it? That's pretty final. And so we have to work at that. There are places that I should not go. There are things that I should not look at, jokes that I should not tell, stories I should not listen to, words that I should not say, conversations that I shouldn't take part in, attitudes towards other people that I shouldn't hold, desires that I shouldn't give in to, feelings that, that I ought to rebuke and suppress, and so on. Now, I think largely, not always, but largely, we know what these kind of things are. It's a resolve to crucify them, 
It's a resolve to quash them that's not always apparent enough amongst Christians. But if we belong to Christ, verse 24, we are to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. So, we need to remember it's the way of Jesus. We need to take action. We did decisively squash and, and strangle wrong attitudes and motivations. And then thirdly, verse 25, we are to keep in step with the Spirit. That is, we reject one path in order to follow another. So, we turn from un-Jesus-like behavior so that we can better follow Him. And that is done by keeping in step with the Spirit. Now, the word used uh, here for keeping in step is a bit of a military word, a bit like our word marching. So, it's more than just simply going along with or chumming the Spirit for a while. It is a concerted, focused nurturing of the ways of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it's a reminder that we do this together. Soldiers were trained to keep in step with one another, to stay in line in order that they might face the enemy with united strength, shoulder to shoulder is how we would express that. And so, keeping in step with the Spirit is the only way to be a Christian. It's basic Christian life. And just as the disciples and the Gospels were following Jesus, going with Jesus, relying on Jesus, learning from Jesus, so disciples today are to do the same through the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit, to follow Jesus, to go with Jesus, to rely on Jesus, and to put Jesus' teaching and ways into practice. That is, we need to become more and more like Jesus. That's what we're called to do and called to be. Why should someone become a Christian and be a Christian in order to be have to be more with Christ and more like Christ. The response to the gospel is not simply, do I believe in God? Can I think that there's a good place for us to go when we die or so on? Rather, the response to the gospel is to follow, to become, to be transformed by the Spirit of God, to trust the Savior and become more like Him. Now, if someone were to give me a recording of all of Beethoven's symphonies and, and I were to listen to them diligently, that wouldn't mean that after a while I could go and write a symphony every bit as good. If someone showed me painting after painting by Rembrandt, that wouldn't make me an artist. But if somehow the spirit of Beethoven could come and, and be with me, well, maybe then I could write some decent music. Maybe if the spirit of Rembrandt could come and be in me, and um, I could maybe paint a bit. But that's not going to happen. But the contrast here is the spirit of Jesus is with is among us, is given to us, so that we can then live the Jesus life, so that we can then do the Jesus stuff. And that's important not just for ourselves, but for others too. You see, the folks that we know, they won't necessarily have a good idea these days about who Jesus is and what He's like. And they're not going to try and figure that out for themselves. They need to see Jesus. How are they going to do that? They're going to need to see Jesus by seeing the life and the ways of Jesus lived out among Jesus' people. They should be able to read our lives and hear the gospel. That's why growing the fruit of the Spirit is so, so, so important. And the life-changing, transforming power of the Holy Spirit, the very power of the Holy Spirit, Romans 1, 4, that raised Jesus from the dead, is given to you, given to me, so that we can fight the flesh and so that we can grow the life of Christ. One Christian leader of the last century used to pray this every morning. Heavenly Father, I pray that this day I may live in your presence 
and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray that this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that should not really be just for our leaders. That should not really be for outstanding Christian. This is basic Christianity. To live in the presence of God and please God, to take up the cross of, and follow Jesus, and to grow the fruit of the Spirit day by day. Do we really want to go back to normal once lockdown is over? Well, in certain respects, yeah. But I hope and pray not. I hope and pray that we can set our hearts on becoming better, more Jesus-like. I hope and pray that we can live more of the life of Christ and so give the world what it needs most, a clear idea of who Jesus is and why He's worth it. Our family, our friends, our neighbors will need to see the life of Jesus in your life and in my life. That is why we've spent these past weeks looking at the fruit of the Spirit. It's to grow the Jesus life. This is who we are and what we're to become. In order to please the Lord, in order to be building His church, and in order to show and share Jesus in a broken and in a hurting world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that this day I may live in your presence and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray that this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to let ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. This theme of being focused on and all for Jesus is the theme of our next hymn, Jesus, All for Jesus. After we've sung it, we'll confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Thereafter, we'll be led in prayer by the folks of Renew. And then, keeping in step with the Spirit, as I say, is something of a military word. So we'll close our service by singing, we are marching in the light of God. But firstly, Jesus, all for Jesus.
I believe in God the Father. Dear Lord, thank you for keeping us safe in, the, safe in this difficult time. We pray for those who aren't as fortunate as us and that are struggling on the impact of COVID on their lives. We pray for who in those particular, those who have COVID families and are struggling with the loss of loved ones. We pray that you would comfort them and be with them and be with them during this difficult time. We also pray for those who are self-isolating and struggling with the impact of loneliness on, on their lives and that we would be able to see our families and loved ones and that as a community we'd, we would come together and support them. We also pray for our churches and that they would stand up for the, our communities in need, especially in response to the Black Lives Matter movement, that we'd be good allies for those fighting against systematic racism. We also pray for the Muslims who are being violently persecuted in China, that we would stand against the oppression, and we pray also for the crisis in Yemen, and that we would be with those who are suffering in these countries. We bring all these people and prayers to you, and ask that you would help us as Christians to show your love and kindness all over the world. Amen. Thank you.